Now this work has as its matrix chips of paint, small chips of paint that I laboriously collected from a decaying building in Los Angeles. Once I had glued all of these small paint chips onto the canvas, I began to paint the tree of life. Visual life, but it's also a sound life. Eighty-three, I played in a group. We call ourselves Hit Machines, and of course, we weren't going to have any hits. But the idea was that we play at small clubs and have a group of topless indigenous women playing bongos and congas behind us, while we showed National Geographic footage of wild places on the earth, giving totally of ourselves every time a machine went off. When I was in the Boy Scouts, I had to make an Indian outfit to become part of the Order of the Arrow. When I became an artist in residence at the Exploratorium Art Museum in San Francisco, I had to have a magician costume. Merlin had his stone of making, able to change anything into anything. I want the stone of crying, able to make me feel like crying all the time able to make tears fall, able to stop the world of illusion. The stone of crying is held in the eyes. The stone of crying is not held back. It is free to move you to tears. It is free to rock your world. With the stone of crying, I would set the world free. I would lay it at the feet of Israel. I would lay it at the feet of Palestine. I would lay it at the feet of hate. I would lay it at the heart of stone. I would skip it across the ocean of pain. I would ship it to the cold north. I would give it to Santa Claus. I would place it on the escalator in the mall. I would leave it at the center of the world. stone of crying. that would make it more than a craft, than 
make it into a magical piece of art. When I got there, the sunlight was perfectly illuminating its yellow gold, amber, deep burgundy quality. Its coldness was immense, but I felt it activate me. I stepped in and I went further, and then I went as far as I could to heal the wounds of the past. And I stood there as they were healed. And I knew that I was involved in some sort of ritual that had been performed many, many times before me, and I was just following course until I laid down completely. And then I saw the eagle. In the myth of the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl, the manifestation of collecting from the heavens and bringing it down to earth. I wanted to get the flavor of a master Japanese ink artist like Hakusai and how they added mystery and eroticism and directness in their Zen marks.
from the Star Wars game of tomorrow, working in the Twilight Zone of fantasy, they're called Sex and Violence. And this film does indeed live up to its title, as you're about to see. This is one of those rare examples of a film building to a one-joke payoff, and payoff it does. It's a Ground Zero production. We'll find out more about that local production house a little later. And it was originally shot on videotape. Now, after you've been subjected to sex and violence, I'll return with the 32-year-old producer, Kirk Roberts. In the meantime, I suggest all you adults please leave the room so all of us kids can have a great time watching... Just seen Sex and Violence, and the producer, director of that film, Kirk Roberts, is here tonight. Kirk, where did Sex and Violence originate, in your imagination? Yeah, I think what we wanted to do is uh, uh, do a parody of the uh, phrase you saw from here in, in uh, films these days, uh, either too much sex or too much violence, and uh, to make a comedy on that, uh, that phrase was our, uh, our purpose. And now I'd like to welcome you into the working area place where creations are built, where the miniatures of the sex and violence are created, where ground zero gives you magic. Around the 2,000 square foot area, ground zero's production facility is capable of producing miniatures and full scale objects that represent the real world and the world of make-believe. This piece means a lot to me, of course, because it's dealing with two of my favorite concepts, sex and violence. This film probably comes from something deep inside of me. Not only my influence from other sources, media and TV, but also my love of working and manipulating small objects, figurines, toy soldiers, and especially manipulating figures we build ourselves. What I am, what I am Getting out of this is a, a vicarious thrill. Bar. Lots of sex in this one. Lots of sex. But since you can't see that right now, I guess the only thing that we can give you is... Violence! The storyboard for the film opens with the suburban landscape and the Oasis Motel. Two teenagers approaching the motel and entering one of the rooms. Lights clicked on and revealing the two characters dressed in prom attire. Most of the action with the uh, live actors takes place in this motel room. Here's Johnny showing amazement at 
and you would too, his female partner disrobing. All of the buildings used in this set are collapsible, but when they're hit with masses of water using our flood devices, 40 or 50 of these all lined up in a row, these buildings will, believe it or not, collapse and break apart as if they've been hit by a tremendous volume of water. He's constructed other buildings that are made specifically to be crushed by the robot's foot. The pressure of the foot wearing the mask that will soon be the headpiece of this thousand-story robot. John, let's see what you look like. Huh. The head turns and they pivot and tilt in ways. people 